webinar. So you will have all that. Uh, my name is Sharon D'Onofrio. I'm the Director of Learning with USAID Invest. And again, a big welcome to everybody online. Uh, next slide, please. I want to just start off by introducing our contributors and also thanking them for their um, participation. First, Steve Shira. Steve is the contracting officer's representative for USAID Invest, and he also serves in USAID's private sector engagement hub. Also, we are joined by Nora Brown, the chief of party for USAID Invest. Invest is a global buy-in mechanism designed to mobilize inve investment for development and reduce the barriers uh, for the agency in working with the private sector. We're also very happy that we have representatives of two of Invest partner organizations. Uh, Jake Kusak is managing partner of the Cross Boundary Group, a firm focused on bringing capital into underserved markets to drive sustainable growth and strong returns. And Beatrice Durette, managing partner and CFO of GECA in Haiti, a consulting company specializing in management, financial studies, surveys, accounting, and audits for growing business. So uh, thank you again and welcome to our contributors. I'll quickly just run through the agenda. We'll start out with some uh, uh, introductory remarks from USAID. Then we'll uh, a bit of an overview of USAID Invest, our purposes and how we operate. And then we'll move into a discussion and presentation with both Cross Boundary and GECA. We'll look at uh, transaction advisory services, both for market building, but also support the individual firms. And as was already mentioned, there is an opportunity to put questions in the chat and we'll do our best um, to get to them at the end, but feel free, don't wait till the end. You can drop them in at any time and we'll take notice. So um, next slide, please. Just generally overall objectives, obviously want to help you a, a better, uh, uh, obtain a better understanding of the value of transaction advisory support in relationship to achieving development objectives. And then very importantly, to provide tangible examples of how USAID and their partners can work effectively with transaction providers. So uh, that sh all this should come out in the presentations in our discussions, and certainly feel free to ask questions if we need to follow up more in either one of these areas. So again, with that, I'll pass it over to Steve from USAID for a few opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Sharon, and welcome everyone. Welcome on behalf of uh, USAID. I'm really, really happy to have your participation and um, you're listening for this because this is a really proud moment for all of us. Um, I have, I'm very blessed to be the contracting officer representatives or COR. Uh, for the invest mechanism. Um, it has been a tremendous effort over the last six plus years um, with invest and we've learned a lot and that's kind of the core of what invest does. And so I'm really proud to kind of open up this webinar to talk about one of the, the aspects of invest, one of the themes that we kind of go through here. Um, but let me start first with um, you know, towing the company line here, I'll go through the USA policy framework um, and how this relates to this discussion today. So USA in, in March, uh, we released our policy framework, which is the overarching kind of um, strategy and policy that, that guides USAID. And it aligns very well with what uh, Invest has been doing, what our partners have been doing, what we're trying to do in the private sector engagement hub. So let me just read it for you. Our policy framework says is that USA will drive progress beyond programs by three things, um, embracing new partnerships and investing in USA's enduring effectiveness to confront the greatest challenges of our time. So what do all those kind of mean and how those mean in this kind of invest context? So embracing new partnerships. This means uh, working closely with private sector, engaging and implementing with local partners and organizations and thinking long-term to sustain that kind of success. Uh, our talk today on transaction advisors is a part of this type of partnership. It's allowed USA to tap into large networks of expertise, innovation, 
and with a results oriented approach that moves us beyond the progress, uh, moves us to progress beyond programs. Uh, it's additionally, it's a local function. Locally, we look to uh, how these services strengthen local ecosystems so that more investment can be easily obtained into the future. Again, deepening these uh, partnerships uh, for, for part of our framework here. Um, the second point is uh, investing in USAID's enduring effectiveness. So we're all proud, we, we say this a lot, we're all proud of invests uh, $1 billion of private capital mobilized. Um, and they always cringe when I say this, but there are other aspects of invest that are, we are also very proud of. One of the things is actually uh, that invest is in its core DNA, a learning modality. Um, the invest legacy, in my view, um, the knowledge that we've acquired and the learning that we've spread through forums like this is really the, the crown jewel of what we're doing with invest. And it's something that I'm most proud of um, in doing this. Um, you know, we look at kind of all these uh, mobilization of private capital, um, but it is just a means to the end. It doesn't mean anything if, they're, if the results are not sustaining, if we're not learning from those results. Um, and we need to look uh, to to create a um, a better world out there. And uh, the way that we look at transaction advisory services uh, helps build that kind of capacity and that opportunity that was not there before. Um, and finally, with just the embracing, we're this year we embarked on what I called the invest legacy learning. Um, it's a retrospective on key themes of learning. Over the last 6 years of invest, um, this transaction advisory services brief is 1 of them, and it's a very good 1 as well as the resources that we'll share at the end. We also have 1 in capital catalytic capital, and we have an upcoming uh, paper on the roles of partners with our uh, finance and investment network or the fin. Finally, I just want to go through the greatest challenges of our time, which is well. We've all heard the statistics that we're uh, th there's a three trillion dollar financing gap that we need to achieve the SDG goals. We know the world is complex, and we need to use as many tools in our toolbox to get there. And this includes uh, the transaction advisory services, which helps us uh, progress to address the big challenges of our time, like climate and health and inclusive growth. Um, Invest and other transaction advisory pro providers in USAID have shown real results in mobilizing capital for these dire needs. Um, our aim is to understand and uh, what works and how to support the replication of success practices in new markets. We want new programs to build on the experience of Invest and to continue to innovate for greater impact. Our event today will help explain these concepts in much more detail, but essentially these services facilitate investment by helping capital suppliers and capital seekers connect. And that's really what we're all about is those kind of connections. So with that, I wanted to again, give you all a warm welcome and thank you all for attending wherever you are in the world. Um, and I'll turn it over to Nora for to walk us through the next steps. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks so much, Steve. I really appreciate that. And we don't cringe when you say the 1 billion isn't the biggest thing because we agree. There are so many other great learnings and achievements on invest. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Nora Brown and I'm the chief of party on invest. Um, just to give you a quick overview of the mechanism for those not as familiar. Um, we are a 7 year mechanism funded by USAID and we're focused on mobilizing investment for development outcomes. As already mentioned, we do have a really strong learning mandate and have had the benefit of being able to experiment and learn over the years. And so we've been able to gain a better understanding of what types of interventions are most effective for different contexts or objectives and how best to use USAID funding to incentivize private sector actors to realize critical development results. You go to the next slide. Thanks. So over the years, um, Invest has sort of learned from its demand-driven approach. What are kind of the types of services that are needed from the different USAID missions and bureaus that we work with? 
Um, and we've uh, come up sort of it's come down to more or less um, four different service areas where transaction advisory is one of these four. And while each area has distinct objectives, all of them contribute to mobilizing finance for development. Our job has been to work with USAID to understand the need in each context and employ the right approach, or in some cases, we found a combination of approaches that really best meets the development objective at hand. Transaction advisory has proven to be essential in closing high impact deals in USAID priority sectors. And also it's been um, incredibly impactful in promoting stronger, more developed investment ecosystems that can attract capital in the future. In our six years of implementation to date, we've raised over a billion, which yes, is exciting for us, but not everything. Um, and that capital, um, in, in raising that capital, we've really relied heavily on our transaction advisory partners. Um, and as you can see, they've closed 78 individual deals. Some of those deals involved enterprises or firms, and other, other of those have involved funds or vehicles. Um, and the range and size of the deal has been great. Um, and that really speaks to the specific need and objective and context in which we work. Um, we've really found that each engagement is unique. And this is where we really rely on the expertise of our partners, two of whom we're excited to have here today. For example, when we're working with funds and financial vehicles, we've had to spend time and resources setting up appropriate structures to attract appropriate capital, such as institutional investors and pension funds. Whereas support to firms has ranged, ranged from SMEs to larger agribusinesses and may include activities like financial modeling and valuation, tech, pitch deck preparation and investor matchmaking. We've also seen a diversity in sub program areas with some USAID missions having a very narrow focus on 1 or 2 sectors that are a priority for them. While others are sector agnostic and are focused more on transactions with high potential for employment, for example. So, as you can see, the graph shows financial services and clean energy have been a major focus of these transactions, which might not come as a surprise given agency priorities. So, as I mentioned, invest is in our 6th year of implementation and we have evolved our approach to designing and managing transaction advisory services over the years based on um, the learning and the experience that we've had. This is most notable in these 4 areas here where our role has been to adapt and improve our approach based on what we have seen works and where we've had challenges. We'll discuss some of this learning in more detail through this presentation. Um, but just to give a quick overview, in the area of solicitations, we use various tools such as requests for information, statements of objectives, et cetera, to solicit valuable input from market actors in order to inform strategy. So we avoid being too prescriptive as we really like the expertise of the market to inform the best approach or strategy for the given context or the objective that we're trying to, to reach. In partner selection, we've worked with multiple different transaction advisory providers, and we've learned to value things like presence in local markets, expertise in key sectors, and strong investor networks. Our approach to scopes of work has also evolved um, to contemplate the need for flexibility and execution, uh, really allowing partners to adjust uh, in response to market dynamics. And then performance based agreements that incentivize deal closing deals um, has also been something that we have learned quite a bit about over the last 6 years, making sure that we're allowing for risk taking um, given many of the markets in which USAID works uh, to achieve greater development impact. So, hopefully that gives you just a good um, overview and understanding of invest um, some of our work uh, and why we're so excited about this particular learning um, around transaction advisory services. And so with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Jake from cross boundary. Great, thanks very much Nora. Um, thanks everyone excited to be here um, just as a quick background i'm co-managing partner of cross boundary we're a firm focused on bringing capital into underserved markets um, we have about uh started about 12 years ago and we now have around 200 people in 25 offices um, almost entirely in frontier uh, and emerging markets um, i thought it might be interesting to, to go a little take a little bit of a step back before we get in the weeds of, of what happens in specific transactions and talk about 
why there's a need for transaction advisory services and why it makes sense, at least some of the time, for donors or other third parties to pay for them. Um, we published a paper 10 years ago in 2013 on investment facilitation in fragile states, um, which we then updated five years later. And sort of the core thesis of that paper was that in most, for most sectors and most geographies, there's actually a lot of capital av available in the sort of hypothetical. There's um, plenty of DFIs or other funds that have capital they haven't deployed yet, but commitments to be in those geographies. As you frequently will hear from people, there's trillions of dollars of private capital that's sitting largely in cash or just in government bonds, um, but says that it has a mandate uh, to um, invest in these markets or invest in sectors around climate change, um, for instance. So there is actually a lot of capital out, out there. Um, and even in the most difficult markets, when we started, we were focused in markets like Iraq, Afghanistan, Mali, even those most difficult markets, um, it doesn't just have to be grants. There's still opportunities um, to make a solid return in a number of sectors. Um, there is uh, investment opportunities there. So why are these investments not happening? Um, and our belief is that the core reason is because of high transaction costs, and I'll talk a little bit later about what those mean exactly, and high information asymmetries that prevent the capital that is available from flowing into these um, bankable opportunities or nearly bankable opportunities, and therefore supporting intermediaries and advisors as Invest has done that address and lower these costs can unlock these stalled deals um, and then create a substantial development impact. Uh, next slide. So this is the framework that we use to think through the barriers. Again, these slides will be available, so I'm not going to spend too much time on any of them, and you can look at them later. You have all of your sort of classic macro level constraints at the top. So, you know, poor enabling environment, um, lack of enabling infrastructure, things that, you know, take a, a while to fix. Um, these things are often the focus of sort of bigger overarching development strategies, both from the own government of the country and for from others trying to help. Then at the sector level, um, you often have challenges where there's sort of an incomplete ecosystem. There's a there's a coordination challenge because um, if you want to solve or provide a particular good or service, you have to provide the whole value chain. You can't just pick a particular niche because other enabling parts might not be there. Um, and so this is why you often see companies in these markets pursue a strategy of vertical integration. Um, and again, when donors try to help, they might have a strategy that's trying to do multiple things at once through the sector to unlock that sector. Then you have these firm level challenges that I was talking about. The first and what people think about sort of, I think most obviously is lack of capital um, for the risk return balance that an opportunity has. And you can further think about the differences um, or the, that might prevent that capital from being employed in three different categories. One is it's a high perceived risk, but there's actually a good return. So it's more of a perception challenge or it's a first mover challenge. No one's done it before, but once it's proven, there's that sort of 15%, 20% IRR um, that should be satisfactory um, to investors. There's other areas where there's actually a structural challenge. The customer doesn't have the ability or willingness to fully pay for a service. So you might think of mini grids um, providing rural electricity. Usually for those to work, there needs to be some level of structural subsidy, um, typically provided by the government or World Bank or other such programs in order to allow um, those mini grids to get off the ground. And we can see a future point where they will be making commercial returns, but structurally right now they're not there. And you see sometimes a similar thing in rural agriculture, or you have a timing and liquidity type issue um, in terms of uh, the willingness of an investor to have long enough time horizon to see an opportunity fully through. The next category though, are, are these transaction costs. Um, and I think they're a little bit less obvious until you think through the process of what it takes actually for an investor to commit capital or for an entrepreneur to raise it. So for an investor, you know, investor, for example, that might have invested um, in the Middle East, but has never invested in Africa before, what do they have to do to be able to find those opportunities? Well, they have to invest in sourcing and originating good deals. They have to have a good understanding of the market and the sector. They have to have comfort um, that they or their partners have sort of boots on the ground to understand and know the risks and see through these opportunities. And all of those things are a cost, a cost that has to be incurred before an investment can be made. And the same thing with a business. You might be a business and you might you know, be you know, great at um, food production or great at 
uh, garment manufacturing, but you're not necessarily an investment banker. You're not necessarily an expert in corporate finance. And often in these markets, um, there's what we call blended finance. So there's both public and philanthropic capital available alongside private capital. And putting those all together, understanding all those different sources is again, a cost that has to be borne. Um, and if the organization doesn't have the resources internally to take on those costs, um, they might, that transaction might not happen. There is also just an inherent um, information asymmetry issue, uh, a lack of uh, trust off in these markets. I've heard um, several people say that sort of, you can think of emerging markets as markets where trust is low. And so where trust is low, again, due diligence requirements are gonna be higher, worries about contract enforcement are gonna be higher. Again, all, all of these are, are the kind of costs that advisors, um, transaction advisory services can help address. Um, but those services don't necessarily exist at the scale that's necessary in some of these markets, or they might be too expensive relative to the initial deal size that's happening. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So investment facilitation, just to boil it down, is the idea that a third party will partially pay or fully pay for targeted firm level transaction advisory assistance to investors and companies to unlock these deals to build trust, to reduce transaction costs. And to do this, of course, for only deals that have a development benefit that the donor or the DFI or the government or whoever else might be helping support these services um, believes is worthwhile. At the core of any of this, and this is what this sort of semi-complicated diagram says, but on the left, you have sort of your sources of financing. On the right, you have your actual companies and projects. And in between, you have these different tools of investment facilitation. This is focused on a more US government type lens to investment facilitation, but certainly um, other governments, other donors are doing it as well. Um, and so you have that sort of transaction support, investment facilitation support provided by USA, MCC, Commerce, TDA, et cetera. Uh, you also can have government side facilitation and you can have USAID, others working on some of these enabling environment issues that we we're talking about at the beginning as well. Next slide. So I started to talk through this a little bit, but just to think about, yeah, in the specifics of each uh, transaction, what are the types of things that a transaction advisor might be supported to do through a program like USAID Invest? It could be making that initial map of what are all the available sources of capital um, for a given opportunity and helping an entrepreneur understand which ones are gonna be best for them to access. On the flip side, it could be bringing investors and bringing many investors at once a set of pipeline, a set of opportunities for them to look at, as opposed to each of those investors having to individually pay, you know, fifty thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars to map all the good investment opportunities in East Africa, for instance. It can be done once and then shared to the entire universe of investors that could be interested in those opportunities. Then, once you have that initial interest and opportunity, you move into due diligence. There's often questions around uh, the size of the market, the viability of the business plan. Um, cost of inputs, um, verifying, you know, assumptions around uh, the, the growth of the company, um, financial due diligence, governance type issues. And again, transaction advisors can help lower the cost for the investor to understand all of those issues or for an entrepreneur to properly make their company more bankable um, and ease this pathway to a transaction. Then you actually get into the structuring and negotiation of the deal. Um, this is, you know, more legal documents are involved again for the entrepreneur. This is something that they're only doing, hopefully, you know, maybe once, twice, three times over the entire life of their company. They're not in the business of negotiating share purchase agreements or subscription agreements or convertible debt for a living. And so therefore it makes sense for that to be the domain of transaction advisors, which are expert in these matters, um, and can help for the specific period of time when it's most relevant. And then once the investment comes in, then you're shifting into this value creation um, phase, uh, which can often be part of the initial investment planning. Next slide. So I thought I'd just quickly go and we can return to some of this in the Q&A, but like some of the typical questions that come up when someone says, okay, yes, we do wanna, we do believe that these transaction costs are a barrier. We wanna make it easier for investors to come into this country. We wanna make it easier for entrepreneurs here to raise capital, but where do we focus our efforts? Um, and there's two levels of that. The first is sort of sector selection. Um, and my favorite phrase here is just thinking about what's your Venn diagram? What is the Venn diagram of where you know there 
uh, or determine that there's private sector interest and investment, where you determine that there's the development impact or the impact that the donor, that the third party, the foundation that's might be paying um, for this program cares about. And then the interests of uh, the local government um, and the interests of um, who's, who's those who are funding the services. And you might have a slightly different Venn diagram. This is just an illustrative one that comes out of a paper we did with Tony Blair Institute, um, I think three or four years ago. But this idea of you're looking for, again, the, I mean, all, blended finance is all about what is that sweet spot where interests converge and it can be a win-win um, transaction for the different parties involved. And then once you've chosen a sector or geography, then you might have a more detailed scorecard to help evaluate what transactions receive this sort of subsidized assistance um, that have, could have scoring dimensions around impact, always around additionality. You don't want these to be deals that you feel like would just happen without any support. Um, and, and of course, that they're actually commercially viable, that they don't just sound good and have the right sort of development buzzwords, but they're actually going to make money and grow um, and attract um, more and more investment. Next slide. Um, another thing that we hear about is, okay, we were doing investment facilitation, but let's, let, let's get the biggest number possible. We want to do billions of dollars of deals. Um, and it's nice to have big headline numbers, but it's also important to remember that pioneer deals, which can be you know really small deals, $500,000 deals, million dollar deals, can have disproportionate value that goes beyond um, that dollar figure. Often the bigger dollar figure deals are more likely um, to happen anyway. Um, and it's these smaller sort of first mover deals that are the more challenging. Um, there's a good paper by Paul Collier and a few others that came out a couple of years ago that talks about first mover disadvantage, that in these markets, it's harder to be the first to do something in a particular sector and then when you look at these um, sectors that have grown, let's look at something like, um, uh, you know, solar energy in Africa, which is, you know, obviously taken off um, across mini grid, solar home systems, utility uh, in the last 10 years. Those very first deals that proved that it was doable, that set up the legal frameworks um, for how these deals could be done, that determined what was the uh, market's willingness and ability to pay, um, those broke the path for the deals that came afterwards. The same thing for garment manufacturing, the same thing for, you know, doing something in the creatives in industries or the first player um, to make a name in fintech in Nigeria. All those players also help break a path for those who came before them. And so there's public good benefits that go beyond the individual company and investor in all of these deals, which is why there is actually a good justification for using donor dollars to support these deals. Um, it's not just about helping uh, that individual investor or company, though obviously there's going to be development benefits from just the single deal, but also the ecosystem effect uh, as a whole. Next slide. Um, just to also think about how do you incentivize the right type of behavior from transaction advisors when you're doing these programs? Um, there's three reasons, primary reasons, why transaction advisors can't just already do this on their own for free. Um, or not for free, on a, on, a, on a commercial basis in these markets, as they do, for example, in the US. The first issue is that the deals are typically small. And so that means that there's less fees to go around and the size of that fee might not be enough to justify the effort from the transaction advisor. Um, in addition, uh, these deals typically take longer to close. In general, when we look at all the deals we've been involved in, we see somewhere between six to 18 months for a typical deal uh, to close six for more you know, venture type deals. It can be in excess of years for project finance type deals. That's a very long working capital burden for an advisor to bear um, for a small deal. And so that plays into the probability of the success of these transactions. Even when we go out to these markets and pick what we think are a great set of deals or high potential deals, let's put it that way, um, we find that usually only about 50% of them close. Um, which is a very, you know, I think natural thing. Not all deals are as quality as you think when you go into them. Um, and so that is another barrier why transaction advisors can't simply just service this market completely privately. And then there's also a lower volume of deals. Um, and as mentioned, a longer time to close these deals. And so again, if you're an investment banker in the US, um, you probably have a set of bigger deals. Those deals are closing faster. They're more likely to close. And that's enabling this whole robust ecosystem that exists in the US. 
Um, you don't, of course, necessarily have that same kind of ecosystem if you're talking about Sierra Leone or Liberia or Mali um, or even Ethiopia. Um, and so that's part of the reason to support these um, types of transaction advisors and critically why success fees alone are not enough. I, the, one of the most common things I hear is we want to be focused on results. We only pay for results. We'll only pay for the success fee. Well, that does solve one part of the problem. It solves the size of deal problem. Now there's a success fee that's big enough to justify effort on the deal. It doesn't solve the long time required problem. It still takes nine, 18 months, maybe more to close these deals. And at least usually 50% of them will fail. So transaction advisors, if they're only getting success fees, they will still focus on generally the biggest, highest probability, most likely to close already deals, which are by definition, the least additional. And so as you think about setting up a, your program, you want to have um, a few different parameters where you're rewarding, you know, companies for good closes with success fees, but also recognizing that some deals might take longer or some deals might actually have challenges and perhaps shouldn't close. And so that have a willingness to pay for deliverables along the way um, in terms of, uh, you know, some of the things that I talked about on the previous slide, the market mapping, the legal documents, being able to pay for those in stages along the way and not just wait for a final success fee because that might actually incentivize the wrong kind of behavior. Next slide, and I think this is the last one. Just to say, I think, you know, since uh, we and others, many others, um, certainly there's many, many partners in, in this work have been, ha have been undertaking this approach. There's been a great track record of deals closed in a number of geographies, including ones that people think are really challenging, like Iraq right now, Lebanon right now, Mali, DRC. You can get deals closed. Um, but again, the success rate on close is, is um, a bit below 50%. And I think that's where it should be, because that means you're taking on deals that do really need the help. Not everything's an easy one to close, and you are finding that right mixture of additionality and focusing on pioneer deals. I think that's it. I will hand it over to Beatrice. Hello, everyone. Very happy to be here today with all of you. Next slide, please. GECA was created in 2012 by a group of young women professionals with different backgrounds to provide a range of services to clients. Our offerings include legal, fiscal, accounting, and technology services. I joined GECA in 2017 as a partner after working seven years at KPMG as an auditor and a couple of years at BUH, which is a Haitian commercial bank, where I was a VP of Treasury. We at GK are a boutique advisory firm, and this is why when a client comes to us, we want them to feel comfortable knowing that there's a team of professionals at their disposal for the, their business needs, and we are ready to respond to the market. What we sell is the tailoring of our services. Next slide, please. In 2019, we started working with Invest in assisting local SMEs with accessing the financing they needed to grow their businesses. Asian SMEs struggled to access financing because of the precarious local climate. In Haiti, banks are hesitant to lend to growing businesses, and foreign investors are wary that the returns won't outweigh the risk. Through our work under AD Invest, we have been advising Haitian SMEs across different sectors and assisting them in securing debt or equity investment. With our banking experience, the advisory services in DAI was a perfect fit. We could use our knowledge in helping SMEs obtaining financing. Next slide, please. Looking across Haiti, there are many small businesses in need of financing, and they don't always know how to get it. Through Haiti Invest, USAID is closing the gaps between large businesses and small entrepreneurs by connecting technical advisory firms like GK with SMEs. We are able to look at the structure they've got in place, identify strengths and weaknesses, and then connect them to the appropriate funders. The geopolitical situation in Haiti has been making our work and our deliverables more difficult to achieve. However, we found that through our strict onboarding protocols and developed on, that we developed under INVEST, we've been able to select and work with viable businesses who have either 
who ha either have the measures in place to overcome these complications or are willing to work with us to develop them. We assist our clients in all aspects of their business to help them become investable. For example, in our due diligence process, we do a leverage ratio to see if the client is ready for debt or capital. If not, we work with them to get them at that level. The objective of this partnership is to promote and facilitate private investment in Haitian small and medium-sized enterprises. GECA aims to make AD a better, more business-friendly place for investors in small and medium-sized enterprises. One of our pillars at GECA's business model is the transfer of knowledge and skills, both within and outside of the company, as we thrive to grow and expand. The pathway to prosperity rests on knowledge sharing and creating meaningful collaboration and partnership between developers, organizations like USAID, and for us in Haiti at JICA. Haiti's journey to prosperity requires these equal knowledge transfers, which will ultimately facilitate sustainable economic growth. Next slide, please. When we first started working with uh, IT Invest in 2019, our goal was to raise $400,000 in capital or debt financing for local SMEs. And we are proud to say that after five years, we raised over $19 million with six companies in, in multiple sectors. Um, main sectors is a corporate business. We have financial institution and like Haitian banks and DFIs. And the sectors we're working with, uh, we have a financial project, manufacturing and distribution company, clean energy, agriculture, in hospitality. Next slide, please. Here is an example of one of our SMEs, which is La Perle, is a manufacturing and distribution of local products, sanitary products. Um, through these four years, we helped them, we helped them obtain three loans. The first one was to increase their local production of sanitary products. The second loan was to buy a land um, near their current warehouse. And the third one was to buy more equipment to triple their overall production and distribution. Um, after four years, LaPel was not only able to grow their operations, but also increase employment. They went from having 15 to 44 employees in rural and urban areas of Port-au-Prince. Thank you very much. That was my last slide. For any queries, uh, don't hesitate to write the email to our email and you can also visit our website to learn about our work and our social responsibilities. Fantastic. I want to thank all of our speakers, um, really, and I think we touched a lot of points. Some of the, the that Nora gave, how to work with USAID, identify the development of objectives and then turn tangible services and scopes of work, et cetera, with partners. I certainly appreciate Jake providing the conceptual overview, the definitions of big pictures, uh, so to speak, and Beatrice, thank you. Um, obviously, the work in Haiti is must be tremendously challenging, and we're um, just thrilled with the work you're doing and congratulate you as well. Uh, we do have a question in chat, and I have a few questions as well for the, the speakers, but um, feel free to put a few more in as we talk. But Alex from USAID Kenya East Africa region, he's saying, the state of the market is a big issue. So um, opinions on how to deepen the market. So it's talking about kind of market level impacts to ensure those in investment flows in the future. Um, I'll hand that one to Jake uh, first off. Sure, thanks, Ryan. Um, and hi, Alex. Yeah, and I think this, this your point around exits is a, is a key one. Um, I mean, I mean, one just even o overarching point is is you know the the track record over the last 10 years of private equity funds, of SME funds in Africa has not been that great, to be honest. I think, you know, on average, net returns have been below um, where people hope they would be. Um, and so that's made it a, a more challenging fundraising environment, both for companies and for the funds that are trying to raise money to invest in those companies. And one of the reasons that those returns have been low is because of the lack of exits. And so you have P funds that invested you know, maybe as long as 10 years ago, 
that are still holding that investment and haven't been able to sell it on to a new investor or sell it to a strategic company that might acquire um, their investment or IPO it. And so they're still sitting on that capital. They haven't been able to return it um, to their original limited partners, the investors in their fund, and this is lowering the returns. So I think helping facilitate good exits is just as important as helping facilitate good entries. And in this current climate, in some cases, it might even be more important. Um, but historically, I think the emphasis has always been on, you know, doing the deal, just trying to get the money in. Um, and that's how the incentives are set up for most um, DFIs and donors and our players. It's all about those dollars deployed. And it's not necessarily seen as as much of a success story to have, you know, someone selling and, and reaping the gains from that original investment. And so I do think there's scope to um, support those exits um, and then also do things um, more at the, the sort of macro or even regulatory layer that can um, help enable those exits to happen more easily. I don't know if that answers your question. Feel free to continue it in the chat if you have, have more on that. Thanks, Jake. Yeah, and I think we all appreciate that longer term perspective. Um, a lot of what's been uh, brought up by Steve initially and then Nora and Jake particularly is kind of the role of donors um, and why their support intervention is needed in, in these markets. And Jake, specifically, you talked about additionality and ensuring additionality. It's definitely a conversation we have a lot at USAID, even when we're setting up the original with USAID, we're setting up those original scopes. So I guess I want to put a question out to Nora first and then uh, definitely Jake and also Beatrice, you know, how can we ensure that when donors intervene, engage transaction advisors, that, that they are actually adding value and specific examples are great, um, specific either transactions or maybe how you've structured the scoring of a transaction or scopes of work, really concrete, because I, I know um, that's where a lot of learning, uh, there's a lot of interest in learning and potential for learning. So I'll, I'll ask Nora perhaps to respond first. Sure. Thanks, Sharon. I um, appreciate that question. And um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, you know, I think Jake gave a, a pretty good overview of, of why donors are needed in this space in general. Um, most of the markets in which we're working, um, the firms that are seeking funds don't necessarily have the means to be able to engage advisors and, and don't necessarily have the means to do uh, the transaction work sort of in house. And so um, certainly, the donor work that we've seen to support transaction advisory um, has been a really critical step in order to get these transactions closed. But I think more importantly, to get some of these investors to look at these markets that they're not so familiar with uh, and sectors that they don't have as much um, experience with. And so, you know, where we've seen success is where, um, you know, donors have been willing to and, and USAID has been willing to really leverage the expertise of the transaction advisors. Um, let them sort of with their deep knowledge and understanding of the market sort of drive the way through a portfolio approach. I think it's been really important to, you know, markets are um, fluid and dynamic, and I think we need to be that as well. Um, and so continuing to um, take a, a portfolio approach and, and letting advisors pivot and react to the market um, as market shifts and change so that we can really pivot for success. Um, you know, I think in terms of additionality, I think we need to be um, sort of thoughtful and clear upfront around the objectives of any given engagement, um, whether that is particular sectors that are critical to development objectives in that country, or whether it is some other uh, development impact, such as um, employment and job creation. And so with that in mind, I think we can be more targeted and specific in the types of deals um, that might be appropriate for the support that donors are funding. Um, and I think, you know, and the point's been made, I think it's, it is really important to, to think about the size. Um, you know, we fall sort of, uh, you know, in this category of promoting our $1 billion number on invest, which we're really proud of. But I think what's really um, important to know about that billion dollar number is how many transactions make up that billion dollars. And some of them are these very small um, deals that are, you know, 100,000, 500,000, um, and they are critical. And I think the work that donors are doing to support those types of deals um, is so important. And the additionality is so much stronger there than some of these larger deals. 
Now, certainly the lar larger deals can show sort of proof of concept, um, can demonstrate that there's a seriousness to a market and an engagement. And so, you know, there's value to those as well, but really looking broadly, I think is, is critical to achieving that additionality. Um, Beatrice, would you like to respond a little bit yes. how you're managing that in Haiti? Well, I would say that um, donors have to make sure in a certain way that the transaction advisors that are representing them are ac accomplishing their mission and the objectives of the project. Um, we have a very close relationship with the IE and our representative in Haiti. And I think this is one of the reasons why uh, we've been um, accomplishing deals as well is because we have to submit reports. They are aware of what we're doing. And like you said, sometimes we even need their helps for certain things. We had a client the other day that needed a document to finalize a deal and we're waiting for the embassy in the States and they were telling us they could see if they could help us. So at the end, I believe that a close relationship is very important between the donor and the, the TA. Um, Jake, I'll let you respond, and then we do have a follow on question about cost. So, if you uh, would also like to transition to that, just generally cost per business and and really what could be anticipated. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I do think they are related, actually, and I think Beatrice's point is a really important one, which is you need trust and mission and alignment between the different parties. So, the donor that's paying for the services, the advisor that's providing them, and then the companies and investors that are the beneficiary. Um, because paying for advice is a tricky thing, right? It's not like paying for a bag of grain to, for food relief. And, you know, a bag of grain is a pretty clear, well-known um, commodity. And it's clear if it was provided or not. Um, when you're paying for investment banking type advice or financial structuring advice or for a financial model, um, it's not necessarily easy to immediately gauge how much work is going to be required and what is the quality of that work delivered and did it lead to a deal? Um, that was going to happen anyway, or, or, you know, did a deal not happen? Um, and that's still a good thing because actually it was a flawed premise. Um, and so there's a lot of complexity in terms of thinking through the different rel relevant um, uh, metrics, I guess, to, to gauge, is this good advice? And I think at a base level, you need to make sure there's good trust and mission alignment between um, the organizations, um, which again, to me, steers away from a purely success fee based approach, which could be a little bit more um, vulnerable to gaming. You want to have long term partners um, in your uh, advisors. And then this, of course, carries over into pricing. You know, the, the right price for transaction advisory services could, you know, be a couple thousand dollars, um, you know, for help filling out a loan application or understanding which of the relevant, um, you know, banks to send an application to to for very sophisticated you know, billion dollar project finance transactions, you'll, you could potentially spend millions on transaction advisory services, deal construction services over um, multiple years. And so it really depends on the size of the project, the complexity involved, um, you know, is that, that the additionality, the development benefits, you know, how do you judge whether that investment is going to be worth it in terms of what, what it unlocks in the long term? I think there's a lot of different benchmarks that can be used. I think typically in transaction advisory services, we generally seek to get at least 20 to one leverage in terms of a dollar spent on transaction advisory services and then delivered eventually the, the total eventual amount of deals delivered. But that could be lower if it's in a, you know, again, a very challenging market um, like Haiti is, uh, like a Liberia, like a Sierra Leone. Um, whereas maybe in South Africa, maybe your target leverage should be, you know, 100 times or 1,000 times um, if it's enabling you know, a larger uh, capital markets transaction. Um, so I realize that's like a long way of saying uh, it depends, um, but there is th that sort of trust and actually being able to talk through in detail, you know, what services are needed, what are going to be provided and monitoring that over time is re really critical because this isn't just not the same as as buying a bag of grain. Uh, we appreciate that, Jake, and also just calling out the so-called I don't know if you said close rate or failure rate, but knowing half of these deals might not go through and uh, USAID being involved in kind of pushing those boundaries and being able to take those risks where other investors can't 
is potentially really a, a big role. Um, there's a question about the lack of financial discipline or financial standardization amongst across businesses. How do you deal with that? Uh, often that's a result of weak regulatory enforcement. I'm going to direct that uh, to Beatrice first. I know she looks at a lot of business records and SMEs and and how are you tackling that? Um, and any examples uh, you could provide would be wonderful. Well, like I said in my presentation, when when we receive clients, we do um, a leverage ratio for them. Um, because clients come to us, they tell us they want this, they want that. What the client wants and what the client can absorb is two different things. So we tell them, this is your leverage ratio. You're not ready for a loan. You don't have procedures in place, um, especially in Haiti where entrepreneurs are businessmen. They don't, they, they, know, they know what they know, everything is in their heads, but they have no procedures, nobody doing their actual paperwork. So we've been doing that a lot, doing the leverage ratio. The clients that are ready for loans, we, we see where we can orientate them. Is it a private equity fund? Is it a commercial bank? which a lot of the times I don't really like working with because interest rates are very high. Is it a development bank? Depending on the sector you're in, where are we going to look for the money for you? So we do all that. And we've been able to develop a very close relationship with our clients. For example, I have a client in energy. Um, anything this guy does, he calls me. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Is it a good strategy for me? Is it a good investment for me? So we try to develop very close relationship with our clients. Oh, that's great. I'll let um, Jake respond as well. Some of that support and in investor investment preparedness. Uh, maybe some examples would be wonderful. Yeah, I, I think that one of the tricky things is, is determining, you know, how how far do they have have to go, and and sort of perhaps you know getting them to the next step um, in terms of uh education on 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 basic uh financial standards and saying okay you're actually not ready to raise this type of capital yet or at least not at the amount that you want you know go work on these things for six or nine months actually hire a cfo restructure your governance so you don't have a bunch of you know family members that are unrelated to the business as shareholders for instance um and then come back and then you're ready to kind of graduate them to the next level of support um there's a little bit of time, which made to answer a couple of other questions uh, in the in the chat, which is just on what's the right mix of local versus sort of international advice and then sector um, types of advice. One, I think it's really important to be local. I mean, we, we have about 200 people. Only 20 of those, maybe less, are in U US or Europe. The rest are in the markets, and that's critical. Um, and then, you know, thinking through the whole suite of advisors and and which ones should be beneficiaries of this sort of third party type support, um, which ones the company can be paying for, the investor can be paying for, and making sure that kind of all those costs are on the table because there's sort of the investment banking type advice, financial structuring advice, uh, there's the, the legal um, uh, side of things, there's commercial due diligence, there can be environmental and social due diligence, there's you know so many different aspects here. Um, and so I think, laying out a little bit of a matrix of, okay, what, what, what do we think is needed to close this transaction? And then who has the capacity to pay for what at the different stages of the deal um, is an important initial exercise. I'm gonna ask, um, thank you, Jake, that's fantastic. I'm gonna also ask uh, Nora on that. Obviously we uh, work with, or Invest, I should say, works with a lot of different transaction advisors, it looks at a lot of responses to solicitation from transaction advisors. Any opinion on how to look at uh, their local networks or expertise capacity around certain sectors and what invest takes into consideration? Great. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Sharon. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think what we have learned, and, and I echo what Jake just said, is you know, having um, local advisors on the ground um, is really critical in the markets in which we're working. Um, and so, you know, we do look for that local presence and that local understanding of the context, but Often um, a number of the deals that we're working with um, are seeking, you know, international investment. And so we are also looking for those advisors that have really strong uh, networks of international investors. Um, and so it's a little bit of both. Um, we've, you know, successfully worked um, 
I think Haiti's a great example. Um, you've got two of our partners on the line here that are both working in Haiti. Um, and we've been able to work with local transaction advisors. Um, and part of that is really, um, you know, part of the, the goal there is to start to build out the ecosystem of transaction advisory support that's um, locally available to Haitian firms. And so I think, you know, somewhat dependent on the objectives um, of the particular engagement um, and the mission, I think there's also dependent on the particular deals um, and, you know, the types of um, investment uh, that a deal might be seeking um, is going to drive some of your um, decisions around, you know, how local, how how international, whether or not you might need um, some different firms to work in partnership together to bring different aspects. Um, but certainly, um, without that local knowledge, um, we have seen um, challenges in really supporting the firms and the enterprises that we're trying to engage. And so that's that's critical, but it's it's that and um, and making sure that we're also connecting um, to these international networks um, and paying attention to how we can make sure we are growing those local ecosystems. I really appreciate that response and uh, fantastic questions. I'm going to ask uh, Natalie to pull up our last slide. I want to call out um, again a learning brief that we put together that draws on. A lot of what we talked about today, we depend a great deal on uh, organizations like Cross Boundary and GECA and many of our other partners to help us synthesize those learnings. So, um, and I can drop, drop that chat uh, link in as well. When you get the slides, you'll see it. Uh, but very specifically, we have things in there like scopes, uh, uh, SOOs or um, strategic objectives. Uh, solicitations, RFIs, things that kind of what we work on advance, invest and how we help define those uh, development objectives with our partners and other really tangible things around templates and even structuring of deliverables. So uh, wanting to share as much as possible with you. Um, next slide. Uh, we also have the contacts of the speaker. So please do reach out. Uh, Jake in particular referenced a lot of good resources that we also utilized in our learning. I'm sure he'll be happy to respond with those as well. If there's additional uh, requests from Invest, uh, USAID, or GECA, please do reach out. I want a, a big thank you to our speakers. Thank you, Steve, for all your support on Invest. And also thank you for opening up, setting the stage, and for uh, representing USAID's really important contribution to this effort. Thank you again um, to Beatrice, and Jake, and Nora, and all the great uh, questions. You'll get a quick prompt. It will ask you for uh, feedback. It'll take 30 seconds. And again, you all get this in your email. I uh, hope you have a wonderful day, wonderful day or evening, wherever you are, and appreciate you joining us. Thank Thanks you so much. See you. Bye. Thanks, everybody.